Welcome to the Veterinary Pulse podcast. My name is Jordan Benchia. I'm the executive director of the VIN Foundation. Veterinary Pulse is the heartbeat of the profession. Join us as we talk with veterinary colleagues about critical topics from student debt to mental health and share stories. Stories connect us as humans, as animals, as a veterinary community. This podcast is made possible through individual donors like yourself and our technology partnership with VIN, the Veterinary Information Network. Thank you for being here. This episode, we're having a discussion with Victoria Macaba, a fourth year veterinary student at University of Illinois. She shares what it's like being a fourth year during a pandemic, how she manages planning for the future, her love for the profession, and advice to the class of 2024. Thank you for listening. Hi, Victoria. Thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me, Jordan. How were you first introduced to the VIN Foundation? So I um, originally, as a first year, was told about VIN as a um, resource for students to kind of get answers to different questions. And here at Illinois, we're lucky to go into clinics um, our first and second year for eight weeks long. So it was kind of introduced to us pretty early. Um, But I didn't know about the VIN Foundation until second year where we had a colloquium talking about student finances and student debt um, and all of the resources available to us to kind of track that debt. And the VIN Foundation student debt resource is probably my favorite thing on your website. It's really put into perspective Um, kind of what my student loans are going to look like after I graduate. So I think that was really my first introduction. And then when I met the wonderful Matt Holland, um, who obviously is very um, involved with you guys, he kind of was able to tell me a little bit more about all of the different resources you provide for all of the people between pre-vet to post-grad. Yeah, Matt, Dr. Matt Holland, he's a VIN Foundation board member, and we love him. He's great. He also works at VIN, so he's a great resource. So when, when did you first realize you wanted to be a veterinarian? Did you have sort of an aha moment, or was it more gradual for you? No, unfortunately, I fall into the category of, oh, my God, this has been my dream my whole entire life. I've never wanted to do anything else. Um, And that's really true. I grew up around animals um, everywhere from horses to dogs and cats. Um, I had a lot of exposure to different fields very early on. Um, I had a cat that had cancer, so he was seeing an oncologist. Um, I've had a dog with a heart issue, so he was seeing cardiologists. So I've been exposed to the profession for a long time, as well as obviously, um, you know, just taking them for their annual wellness visit to our local um, general practitioner. So yeah, unfortunately I do not have a very interesting, like this was when I figured out I wanted to do veterinary medicine, but um, it wasn't until college when I was able to get myself involved with some shelter work, um, but on the medical side, so so more so stay and neuter, that I really started to see the vision come to life. Because at first it was always, you know, this is what I want to do. This is such an amazing profession, but I really didn't know much about it um, aside from what I was just seeing from the client standpoint until I got to do tons of spays and neuters on all different types of animals from dogs and cats to pigs to rabbits that it really became kind of solidified in my mind. Like, yes, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. So you're sort of the classic case of I love yeah. animals, but it grew. <laughs> it grew to something more substantial and, and, and to you realizing that it took more than just loving puppies. Well, yeah. And I had always had an affinity for the like STEM side of the educational system. Like I always did very well in science and math and I somewhat dreaded, you know, social studies and history and English. Um, but I think, yeah, unfortunately, like I love the people who have, especially a lot of students who have second, who are, this is their second career. They have such an amazing story. And I'm just like, yeah, I just really loved my dogs. And then I thought this was a cool profession to be into. And then I got myself involved and I was like, yep, this is what I want to do. Hey, if you can have a dream and it works out where when you get involved in the dream, you still really like it. I think that's clearly a good choice. Yeah, that's true. 
So you're a fourth year at the University of Illinois, and yeah. you are in the midst of this very unprecedented time of living through a pandemic and COVID. How have you found that this new reality that we're living in, or this hope, hope potential one, we don't know, <laughs> this current reality <laughs> impacted your summer plans? Yeah, so unfortunately, um, when the first week that COVID kind of was national news um, was supposed to be my spring break, um, the week before that, I was in the middle of finals, um, and I was supposed to, you know, take my final exams, go on spring break, come back to school, take some milestone testing, um, and then start my clinical year. And unfortunately, when we were sitting down for our final exams, our um, dean had let us know that our white coat ceremony was canceled um, and that our OSCE testing would be postponed and um, that we would be canceling the first block of the rotation. And I remember now looking back, feeling like this was so surreal and it was just going to be a few weeks and they were going to get everything under control. And yeah, you know, missing the first block was upsetting. But in reality, I just kind of looked at it as like a nice little extended spring break, um, you know, and, you know, our, our white coat ceremony being canceled. Well, they, I guess they technically didn't cancel it. They postponed it definitively been canceled at this point um, was a bummer but in the grand scheme of life we were still going to be in the clinic we were done with didactic school and, and that was all very exciting um, so I went home back to the east coast where I'm from I was with my parents and uh, the news kind of got worse from there it felt like for a while I was just sitting on the edge of my seat waiting for the next email from our dean or our ASA office about what was going on, what the decisions are being made, um, as well as kind of just watching the national news and watching what was going on. Um, I'm from New Jersey and that kind of like when you were looking at the original COVID map, that big red dot in New York and New Jersey is quite literally where I'm from. Um, so it was a really scary time overall on top of the anxiety of what is going to happen to my clinical year. Um, and what ended up happening was that we were pretty much home um, from March. I think I left Illinois March 14th and I arrived back here August 1st. Um, the first six weeks of COVID were essentially um, just kind of like off time for a lot of people. Um, some people were fortunate enough to get jobs, um, whether that's at their hometown clinics or local places. Um, I was not, again, just being in the Northeast with how strict they are over there about COVID regulations. Um, I wasn't able to. And then um, we had some online rotations, which the university worked really hard to put on the best possible content for us and make sure that we were still getting the most amount of information as we could not being able to kind of be in the hospital and touch real patients. Um, and then they moved our professional development, which is typically at the end of our clinical year where we're allowed to kind of go off and explore things that are more relevant, I would say, to your desired field or desired career path. Um, and so I was ended, I ended up just doing some online, more online modules um, through the university. And I then I did a one week externship at a cardiologist um, in Connecticut before I came back here for school. And now we just kind of hit the ground running with clinical year. So that was a big shift for you. I mean, for some people, it seems that they stayed where they were, where they like where their school was and kind of hunkered down, but you went home, which means that you went home for a much longer time than you were probably expecting. Yeah, honestly, it's the longest amount of time that I've been home since probably I left for college. Um, you know, we, everyone in our class kind of joked it was, it's the summer break we were never supposed to have. Um, and that's really true. But it was a blessing in disguise. Um, I would got to spend a lot of time um, with my family, um, with my loved ones, with my partner um, that I wouldn't have gotten otherwise. And so, when I look at it at the, you know, when I look at it 
in the grand scheme, what happened to my education is something that I'm still processing. But at the same time, I gained something I would have never had. So that's kind of how I've been like dealing with it so far. I think that's a good perspective to have. There's a lot of things that are not in our control, and this is definitely one of them, but how we react to them is in our control. And it's it's good mm-hmm. to, to focus on the positives of that, absolutely. There's, this is nobody's fault, right? Like this is not the school's fault. This is not my fault. This is not Illinois as a state's fault or any individual state for that matter. Um, and so, there's no one individual or one organization to put the blame on for something like this happening um, in our country. And so at, at some point, you just kind of have to say, like, this is what we're working with and we're doing the best that we can. Absolutely. And feeling that you have that support from your school is really important, I think. And so that's definitely a benefit. Yeah, I agree. And along those lines, you're now a fourth year in the midst of this pandemic, starting your last year of veterinary school, I'd love for you to share a bit of your story about what that looks like for you and what are the things that are on your mind and how are your classmates and you, you know, dealing, dealing with this? So, yeah, it's, it's a lot. Um, right now, I feel honestly very safe going to school. Um, Illinois has developed the saliva PCR testing for the virus. And I, from yesterday, I believe I looked at a statistic that said that the University of Illinois has processed over 1% of all of the tests nationwide. Um, And so we're getting tested twice a week. um, And now it's kind of tracked through an app. And now that the undergrads have come back, they've instituted this access like granted or denied based on your test status. Can you tell me a little bit more when you, this is a saliva test, this is just a cheek swab. No, so it's um, a saliva test where they give us these like long cylindrical tubes and we quite literally spit into the tube. So we have a running joke in a hospital that anytime someone's gonna leave to get tested, you just say, oh, we're gonna go spit in a tube now. <laughs> um, so it's not similar. It's not at all like what a lot of people have been describing, which is like a cheek or a back of the throat or into the nasal sinus passages test. This is just based on the saliva that you produce and you spit in the tube and it gets sent off and you get your results usually, honestly, same day, if not directly the morning after. And you're able to track all of that within an app that you have on your phone. Yeah, it's called Safer Illinois. Um, And so it kind of gives me my status of the last time I was tested, um, what my results were. And then I what I assume because this has happened um, around campus is that if there's a possible exposure. So, for example, um, I'm imagine the students who are living in the dorms. If there's somebody in the dorm who tests positive, everybody on the app is going to get an alert that they've had a potential exposure. Um, and that they need to get tested. And it actually links, from my understanding, to our ID cards that allow us to get into certain buildings. And if we have a possible exposure without a negative test, our ID cards do not work. So we are taking this very seriously, uh, a lot more serious than I feel a lot of other schools are. And I'm really grateful for it. Wow, absolutely. I live in the Central California area and our testing and none of it is anywhere close to anything that you have going on. And that's wonderful. Like that's a great way to really manage a situation. And, and wow, that's fantastic to hear. I'm so, I'm so impressed. So I think it's, I think it is one of the biggest things that gives me a peace of mind while I'm in the hospital setting, because at the end of the day with patient care, you're not going to be able to be six feet apart from everybody that surrounds you. And that's been stated and that has been, you know, agreed upon and kind of just said, this is what being a veterinarian is. This is what being, being a veterinary technician is. You know, when we're holding a dog for a vaccine or a blood draw or whatever the, the test we're doing is, um, you know, even a 70 pound dog, when you're holding both ends, you're not six feet apart. And so knowing 
that everybody around me at all times is getting tested twice a week really puts peace in my mind that if there's a possible positive, that I will have a good chance of being alerted right away so that I can quarantine myself and not, you know, add to this spread. But that in reality, if you're showing up to work and you feel well and everyone feels good, then there's a really good chance that we're all negative and we can go about our day without being worried that we're going to come into contact with someone who is even asymptomatically positive. I would say so. I'd say it's totally fair to have that sort of sense of security. And it's wonderful that the school has taken that those measures to make sure that happens. And that's got to at least give you a little bit, as you're saying, peace of mind as you're in the midst of this crazy last year of veterinary school. Absolutely. And thankfully, you know, with the test results being so rapid, I don't worry you know, for example, I got tested today. I haven't gotten my results back yet, but I expect to kind of get them today so that I know when I go into the hospital tomorrow, I'm walking in with a negative test within 24 hours. And I know, at least for me, that I am not contributing to this and that I am a negative human being and therefore I can do my job without worry. Absolutely, that, that's great. That's, that's one, I'm so impressed. So, so you, so you, you guys are getting tested, and that's that's a big part of it. Um, share a little bit more about how this is impacting your fourth year. I'm fascinated already. <laughs> no, yeah, it's it's changed a lot, and it has kind of created for everybody involved, from the faculty to the technical staff to the students, um, this kind of sense of community. We're all looking out for each other, but for us specifically. Um, obviously, we are masked and socially distant when possible. They've installed a ton of hand sanitizing stations. They obviously encourage you to wash your hands whenever you can. Um, we're doing completely curbside medicine. So we're obtaining histories um, and any information over the phone, usually the day before, um, and then are able to use Zoom or texting with our clinicians to kind of update them and formulate a plan. Um, they get dropped off at a tent outside we meet the clients um, and we kind of just pass them off and then we say okay we're going to take them inside do our physical exam um, and we'll call you when we're ready to discuss what we found today um, so that's like kind of the basis of how the hospital is and how I think a lot of veterinary hospitals whether they're academic or private are running right now um, the only time that clients are allowed in the building are for euthanasias um, so no one's allowed to visit if their dog is in the ICU. Um, no one is, you know, coming in and talking and sitting there in a physical exam room like everybody normally thinks of. Um, and so it does limit the amount of people inside the hospital at one time and as well as limiting the amount of people who are um, not necessarily being tested twice a week because you have to be a member of the university in some capacity to have access to the free testing that I just talked about. Um, they've set up these pods, um, we like to call them, they called them homerooms when we first got introduced to them, but now we all, everyone's just kind of calling them pods, which are designated rooms throughout the entirety of the hospital. And we get one seat with a desk that is ours, and it is ours for the entire year. And in this room is where we are allowed to eat lunch, drink water, be unmasked, do paperwork, do client calls, do whatever we need to do, which would have usually been done in the rounds room. Unfortunately, the rounds rooms, while Illinois is doing a lot of really awesome expansion projects right now, the rounds rooms just are not big enough to fit the amount of students, faculty, residents, possible interns all in that room at the same time while abiding by a six foot distance. And so they've kind of put us in these pods in hopes to give us our own space, um, to be able to eat lunch, to be able to do these things and not wear a mask for 12 hours straight, which I appreciate very much. Um, but it does, it does limit the amount of exposure that we get to our individual services, because in a normal world where COPA doesn't exist, Students would sit in the rounds room all day, 
Um, and when their appointments would show up, they would, do, you know, do their appointments. And then when their appointments left, they would go back into that rounds room. But when the rounds rooms are directly connected or right across the hall from where everything else is going on, if something interesting is, is happening or there's a really cool, I don't know, heart murmur or this dog is, you know, I've been on neurology, so I'm just thinking about neuro things. Like this dog has a very profound vestibular ataxia and they want everybody to walk in and, and look at it so they know what it is. Um, you lose that because when we're not with our direct patient, we're out in our pods and our pods are not very close to, there are a lot of office spaces and classrooms. Um, even one of the equine wards has been turned into an, a giant pod. Um, so we are losing a lot of ex secondhand exposure to just some really interesting things that you might never see um, in a general practice setting because they most likely are going to be referred to a specialty hospital. So I think that is probably the biggest day-to-day -day impact that I've noticed on top of the curbside medicine. Um, but we kind of started in curbside medicine because a lot of us have never you know, none of us have been doctors before, but a lot of us haven't been texts before and probably haven't, you know, done physical exams and gotten histories with clients in the room. Um, and now that we've kind of started with curbside medicine, when we eventually transition to that, I think it's going to be a really difficult one. Right. And I can imagine along with missing that sort of secondary exposure or learning opportunity, really, you're also probably missing the community that you have just being in that rounds room together. Yeah, because unfortunately, the way that they set up the pods, which I understand why they did it, you know, we're sitting in the same seat all year. It doesn't need to, it gets clean. It's like, I think they are spraying down the rooms at night, but overall, it's the same person sitting there as opposed to a rotation. Um, but that means that the people around me are not on the same rotation as me. And while we're still together and we're able to talk and it is kind of nice to say like, oh, how's internal medicine? How's equine surgery? How's dermatology? How are all these rotations? There is a sense of like community and immersing yourself into a specialty or into a certain rotation when all of the people around you are talking about their cases and all of the clinicians are around you reading reports and saying, look at this x-ray and look at this MRI. Um, and so it is, it's a sense of community. It's a sense of being immersed um, and getting the full experience as well as that secondhand uh, learning that I was talking about earlier. Right, that's because that's a big part of school as well. Just having those, you know, small convers, what seems to be small conversations about what each what each other is going through but that is also a you know bonding experience and it makes you feel closer to your colleagues and your classmates when you have these sort of shared experiences and I can imagine are these pods sort of cubicle like or can you give us sort of a visual so they're all very different um depending on the room that you were assigned to so for example my pod is hold is it just a classroom that has been converted um, into a home room. We each have a desk. Um, it's a pretty good size desk. I'm not going to lie. It's probably the size of, I don't know, like a queen size bed lengthwise. Um, and we are all just six feet apart, taped on the floor um, where your chair is allowed to be. Um, and we can't unmask unless we're inside of the red square. Um, and there's only nine of us in there. So it's a pretty small group. However, in the equine wards, like I was saying before, they have set up these folding tables um, with marked seats of, you know, what the appropriate distance is. And there's over, I believe, 50 students in that pod um, spread out, but within kind of like a Tetris type of table setup is the best way I could probably describe it um, so that everybody is kind of safe. One of the other pods that we're using um, is our classroom from last year. And there are marked seats that are the appropriate distance apart. So um, students who are assigned to that pod are able to just use the folding chairs um, and the desk that's associated with that chair um, for their computer or their notebook or whatever they need. 
So those are kind of, it's kind of hard to explain because each of them are so different, but that's the basic overview. It's all taped off and very like easily marked to see like, this is an appropriate place for you to be. And this is not an appropriate place for you to be. Lots of rules. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Understandably. And we keep getting yeah. updates and they keep updating the policies and we keep getting um, every week. They kind of have been sending emails out to saying, this is the updated policy. This is what we're going to be able to do if someone tests positive. Um, but they, you know, it's an ever-changing situation. And so at the end of the day, um, if something changes, they need to let us know. Right, absolutely. And and one thing that you have been very active in is in SAVMA. And you're yeah. you're currently active in that as well. So would you tell us a little bit about your role with SAVMA and how you're feeling the impact of this pandemic in the midst of that role? Yeah, so I um, started as a chapter president um, at my individual local chapter, obviously at Illinois. Um, And last year, I was elected to the National Executive Board um, as the chapter president representative elect. Um, And I've been serving in that position um, all year since last summer. And COVID has kind of uh, made it very difficult for me to get the full experience from this position as well. Um, And I keep saying that phrase over and over again, but it's really true. You know, we've, everything has been converted into an online model. So um, right when COVID hit in March, we were literally two days out from attending our SAVMA symposium, which was hosted by Cornell University. And I just want to shout out their SAVMA chapter for all the amazing and hard work that they put into planning an incredible event. Um, that unfortunately had to be canceled at quite literally the very last minute. Um, And so we very quickly and in a matter of a few days put together an online conference just for our official meeting. Um, The conference itself did not go virtual, but the chapter presidents and the House of Delegates both went online because there's a lot of business that needs to get done um, at the specific time points in the year. And we were hoping and praying and everything we could possibly put the good vibes into that the AVMA convention was going to be in person, which was supposed to be in San Diego this year. And uh, unfortunately, that went virtual as well. The convention was able to switch to a virtual platform. And I'm pretty sure that they actually just wrapped up their convention um, last week. But We did have a few more months to plan um, a virtual meeting for both the presidents and the executive board and the House of Delegates. So between myself um, and my the chipper who was above me before I was um, elected into the full time position, as well as the president and the um, president elect, kind of talked for months in conjunction with the AVMA on to how to make this the most engaging two-day conference on Zoom that you can make it. Sitting on Zoom for eight hours is no fun to anybody. Um, And so we wanted to make it an enjoyable experience. We wanted to give people breaks. Um, We were able to have uh, lunch sponsored one day. So we, everybody got a $20 gift card to a lunch delivery service of their choosing. So whether that's Grubhub or Uber Eats or Postmates or whatever it was. Um, And so we were able to provide some lunch and some fun speakers to come and talk to us um, and then get kind of down to the business. But it's been really difficult because part of the reason why I wanted to continue my term in SAVMA and move to this national um, position was so that I could continue to build these very strong relationships with students from other schools. I think that's always been my favorite part of SAVMA going to these conferences, coming out feeling like I could tackle the world, like I could solve all of the problems in veterinary medicine, and that, you know, our generation of veterinarians are going to be the ones that change it for everybody else. And it's been really difficult, um, not only just losing that aspect, something that you've been looking forward to and planning for, for almost years or very many months, Um, But also just feeling like I haven't seen my some of these people who I consider my very good friends 
now in over a year. And that's really hard um, for me as a human because I value that quality time with people, whether that's one-on-one, going to lunch, just sitting down and catching up. And we've all been utilizing, you know, FaceTime and Zoom as much as we can, but it's just not the same. Um, Nobody's pretending that it is. And so that's kind of been the hardest part for me is just feeling like there's so many people across the country that I love and I want to see them so badly and I just haven't been able to. And I was supposed to see them, you know, three times this year at three different conferences that have now all gone online. Um, And so that's been really difficult. Yeah, that lack of community engagement is so challenging because we as humans, you know, they've done studies that that there's so many things that impact us and impact our health, but loneliness has a huge, huge, not just mental health, um, mental health impact, but also a huge physical health impact. And I think a lot of people are coming definitely within the first three months of COVID, right? I mean, since then things have opened up, closed, et cetera, but it's depending on where you live, it shifts. Of course, it's always shifting everywhere. Mm -hmm. Um, But that lack of human connection is so, so challenging. And I don't think anybody would disagree that Zoom definitely doesn't fill that role, right? Well, I've seen somebody on a computer. (laughs) Absolutely. And I, if if and when, and I hope we can meet, um, I am a hugger. I tell that to everybody, unless I am in like the utmost professional setting, like AKA if I were to be greeting clients, I definitely wouldn't be hugging my clients, but everybody else, I'm like, I'm so sorry, but I'm a hugger. And this is just who I am as a human. And that's why I'm so thankful that I was able to go home um, and be with my parents um, and be with my partner because I do not do well on my own. I do not do well being in solitude. Um, And while quarantine was definitely difficult, it was nice to be surrounded by the people that I love. And so I just can't wait till I can like hug people again and not be like, oh, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Like, I I promise that I'm negative. Like I, I've been getting tested. I promise that I'm okay. You know, it's that like, I go to shake people's hands and I'm like, oh wait, I can't do that anymore type of feeling that I just absolutely hate. Yeah. And that's really hard. And, you know, as kids were taught to like shake somebody's hand, look them in the eye. And I I started wondering, is that just going to totally go by the wayside? I don't know. (laughs) It honestly might, it wouldn't surprise me if this like very young generation who are kind of being taught what I would call polite social manners um, are just not going to learn that because they're going to be like, well, I don't want to touch this person's hand. I don't know the last time that they've washed their hand and they're thinking in this um, time of pandemic while their brains are developing. I, I can't imagine what that would be like, especially I've been thinking a lot of um, my cousins and family and friends who have young children and what it would be like to be raising kids in this time. I, I don't know. It would be, it would be something out of a movie. You know, with this need for community, do you feel, is there something that your school is doing or that SAVMA is sort of doing and pivoting to sort of help you guys give you that, you know, sense of community? Or are there things that you've seen that are being done that are helping that in some way? Yeah, I think that SAVMA has a ton that we've been doing, especially since the beginning of COVID, um, both in resources and trying to kind of keep people engaged with veterinary medicine as a whole. Um, I know that Laura, our GFO, worked her butt off during quarantine to put on amazing, amazing events. She planned um, a 5K, a virtual 5K, I should say, um, between us and two other health professional organizations to raise money to go towards the CDC for COVID funding. We also put on um, a pollinators week talking about honeybee health and resources um, for people who are interested in that um, type of work, environmental work, um, talking about bats and all the different types of pollinators that exist on our planet. Um, And as, at least um, as the chipper, me and Talita, who was the chipper above me, had hosted a few social Zooms with some of our chapter presidents 
um, where we hosted a game night. We hosted what we called presentation night. And so the gist of it was you have to give a three minute presentation on whatever you want. Doesn't matter. Could be anything in the world, um, but it has to be three minutes or less. And so it was really fun to see what people picked. Why, you know, for example, there was one like why leggings are pants, which I 100% agree with. Leggings are definitely <laughs> pants. Um, I did mine on why New Jersey is the best state in the country. Just, you know, a small personal bias, but it's fine. Um, and it was just really, really fun. And it was an easy, relaxed night. A lot of us hadn't had a lot of school responsibilities yet. So we were able to just kind of unwind and talk and catch up and get updates from other schools to see what they were doing. Um, and so we've been trying to kind of keep that sense of community throughout our, at least our chapter presidents. Um, we have our chapter summit coming up here in September that unfortunately also is on virtual. It was supposed to be up in Schwamberg at the ABMA headquarters. Um, and we are doing a virtual escape room on Friday night. Um, and so I'm really excited to see how that goes and how that will impact their team building um, on a virtual platform, right? Because a lot of team building initiatives and retreats that people go on are based on physical trust. You know, there's like the fall exercise, for example, or people will go zip lining and they'll be like, you have to trust that your partner is going to catch you and you're not going to be hanging from a roof. Um, and even escape rooms in person, you know, you're looking for clues, you're looking for ways out of the room um, and you're problem solving together. So I'm really excited to see how this works on a virtual platform. Um, especially for our presidents, because they are going to have to build that same sense of leadership and community within their individual executive boards. And 95% of them, if not all of them, are on a virtual platform at this point. And that's really hard. And that's really difficult when you're not all sitting in the same room and you're on Zoom. And it's easy to mute yourself or stop your video or step away without quote unquote, people really realizing and not being 100% engaged. Whereas when you're in a meeting and you're sitting there and you're looking somebody in the eye, it's very difficult for them to not really pay attention to you. Um, so I really hope something like that is going to help them take this new virtual reality that we're pretty much living in and really be able to apply it so that they can still make positive changes at their schools while their schools are changing constantly. For sure, this is definitely something that makes even, you know, the realities of the current time more challenging and finding ways to create that sort of sense of community. I love the idea of a virtual escape room. I didn't even know that was an option and I'm gonna be looking into that for an upcoming board meeting potentially. <laughs> so uh, Yeah, I didn't know it was a thing either. And then Jackie Ross from the AVMA was like, oh yeah, we're thinking about this virtual escape room. And I was like, virtual? What? Yeah. And she was like, yeah, virtual escape room. And I was like, I've never even been to a real escape room. Like, I guess we'll do it virtually. Like, I, I'm, I'm excited. Well, that's great. And just getting innovative with things, because I think everybody these days are like, what can we do to engage people? Right. We were also, I mean, we were completely set to go to Cornell for SAFMA. And we were at the point where I think it was the week, it was the week before we were supposed to leave and we had everything shipped and we ended up having to, you know, once it got canceled, which I think was the right call based on how things were going. But it was, I mean, our hearts were just breaking for the students because that is my personal favorite conference that we do every year. I just love meeting all the students and yeah. I feel like everybody's so engaged and so enthusiastic and so authentically happy to be there. And so it was, it was definitely a shuffle and we just, we're looking forward to whatever Safma decides to do next year, whether it's virtual or not. Um, but we love supporting Sava and working with the students because it's it's just great to have colleagues that have this different perspective and um, we love engaging with the students. Yeah, well, I thank you for all your support because um, our donors have really stepped up during this pandemic. And like I was talking about that lunch de delivery service was still um, provided by our donors. I believe it was the ABMF, although I'm not 100% sure. Um, and 
it really is, it means a lot to us to have outside, outside entities support us that really care about the students um, because that's really who we serve. Um, we're here as a voice and to make sure that the students are getting the most they possibly can, um, not just out of their SABMA membership, but out of veterinary school as a whole. And so it is really, really nice when I get to meet people at these conferences who are just so interested to hear about what is going on in the veterinary school world right now. A lot of these veterinarians who left graduated school 10 years ago, even Illinois grads, um, are like, oh my goodness, I heard about this new curriculum. Can you tell me about it? I this sounds amazing, da da da. And they're still really interested, even though they've been veterinarians in the profession for 10, 15 years. Um, and so it's just, I love those conferences. And like I said earlier, it's been really difficult to miss out on those opportunities as a professional and as just a person. Absolutely. There's a lot of, I keep thinking about how much has been missed because of COVID, right? I mean, for sure, birthdays, celebrations, weddings, et cetera. But there's so much that just continues to come up. And those parts that we miss, they're not things that you can recreate. I mean, hopefully they will happen at a later date, but a lot of them are just those experiences are, you know, experiences that really enrich us as humans and as professionals. And it'll be wonderful when we're able to gather again and encourage that sort of sense of community. Yeah, I'm really hoping that we get to go to Kansas State um, because it will be my last SAVMA symposium as a student. And so I am just, like I said before, I'm praying, I'm sending all the good vibes. I'm trying to do it differently this time because it didn't work for AVMA convention. So I'm going to try a different strategy, but I'm really, really hoping that we can go. But of course, I understand that the safety of the students come first, um, the safety of the staff and the faculty who'd be running the lectures and the wet labs at Kansas State come first. And so if they don't feel like it is the smart decision to host an in-person conference where hundreds of students are traveling from across the entire country, nobody can blame them. Right. I think that was one of the biggest concerns of SAFMA from this year was just what if everybody gathers and then people get sick and they take it back to all the schools, right? And that would be horrible exactly. and nobody would want that. So, yeah, no. so that would be terrible. <laughs> it would be absolutely horrific. <laughs> so we've discussed sort of how this fourth year is starting for you and the impacts that it's had and the, the your lack of ability to hug and how you know, as we look at going, you know, in the future, how do you think COVID is going to have a long-term impact on your veterinary career, or do you think it will? So at the current moment, I am hopeful that it will not. Yes, I lost time out of my clinical year, but ultimately in a 25, 30 plus long career um, is four and a half months of clinical training going to truly matter, I would really like to hope not. Um, but there is this other part of me that always worries about the what if. And it starts with, well, what if the country shuts down again? And this second wave, which everybody's been talking about, um, happens and we are once again sent off campus and whether or not we convert to an online format for the younger class years doesn't have as much of an impact because they can still get their lectures and still take their exams online it's not the full experience it's not what they signed up for but it's still the same information what's unique about fourth year is there's this fun little clause um, in the COE that is 30 weeks of in-person training required to graduate and hold a license. And that clause, which it says right there, it's got to be in person. If we are kicked off campus again and we are on an online format, we can do all of the online rotations that make our heart happy but we are not going to be able to fulfill that requirement. And so that brings up the question, 
well, what if graduation gets delayed? You mentioned COE. Can you explain to us what that is so that our listeners can be up to date as well? As well, Of course. So the COE is the Council on Edu Education, um, which is a board that is hosted through AVMA. The AVMA is um, the overarching accreditation um, processing organization. I, that was a terrible way to describe that. Um, but they are basically the group of people who visit the schools and say, the students here are receiving an adequate education to then become veterinarians when they graduate. Obviously, the other part of that is passing the NAVLI, which the COE has nothing to do with, but they are the ones who give these over, um, overarching points in what students have to fulfill from first to fourth year to basically be able to graduate. Have there been discussions started that due to the pandemic, that specific wording of in-person might shift? I don't know the answer to that. Um, unfortunately, I'm just not very closely, even though I work very closely with SAVMA, SAVMA is still its own entity. Um, and so I have no idea if that's been talked about. However, I would be very surprised if that were to be changed because personally, I feel like 30 weeks is kind of cutting it close. Um, when I was originally scheduled, I believed, I, I believe when I did the math, it was like 48 weeks of hands-on clinical rotation. And I think now we're down to 36, I believe. So we have some wiggle room. But ultimately, I still don't feel like if it were to be less than that, that I would feel comfortable graduating and going out into practice. And that really becomes the question, you know, I'm somebody, and I'm not, we can talk about this in a minute, I, I'm somebody who wants to pursue the match and internship and possible specialization afterwards. So my training is going to continue. Um, but for a large majority of my classmates, they are not going to do that. And they are going to go into general practice and become associates at these different hospitals. And I don't know that 30 weeks of training is sufficient enough or anything less, I should say, than 30 weeks would be sufficient enough to really have these students feel like they are adequately prepared to be veterinarians. So I don't know, and maybe, but it would, it would surprise me if that was, I would say, I guess would say like excused for our class. Right. That's understandable. Okay. So that could be a shift, right? I mean, cause right now you're looking at, you're at 36 weeks. It says that you need 30. And that seems in a normal world, like a lot of wiggle room, <laughs> but not in a COVID world, right? Right. And that's the scary part because it took from March, when you really think about it, we were sent off campus and told to quarantine when the case numbers were kind of low. And, you know, new ones were popping up and they were occurring at a very exponential rate, which I think was really the big panic of everybody stay home because we don't know how long this has already been going on without these precautions. And so now we really need to start taking them very seriously. And it took from March to August for the proper precautions and comfortability with the numbers for the provost of our college, for the governor of Illinois, for a lot of the colleges around the United States to feel comfortable having their students come back to campus. And we don't, we don't have four and a half months of wiggle room. Right, right. Yes, yeah, six weeks is a long time, 
put it in the grand scheme of what this virus has already proven it can do, six weeks is absolutely nothing. Absolutely. So you're seeing this and you're thinking, okay, if I look at potential graduation, you will be graduating. When you look at your graduation, (laughs) (laughs) when you look at graduation next year and you see the things that you want to accomplish, like matching, et cetera, how do you, how does COVID play into your thought process there? Yeah. So I, right now it really isn't, like I said, um, externships have kind of been hard to come by. I've lost a lot, a lot have been canceled on me. A lot of hospitals just, I think, don't want to run the risk of whether that be a student or whoever coming into the hospital um, and possibly exposing their staff. And, you know, that is a whole another spiel. That could probably be a whole another episode of what a veterinary practice would do if they tested positive. But, um, so it has been kind of frustrating because I was expecting to be able to go to these hospitals and flush them out and see if I would be a good fit and see if I would be happy there. Um, but it's internship and internship is notoriously very difficult. And so, you know, for me, I was kind of thinking about it from a personality standpoint, would I be able to fit in? Because I'm going to be working 60 to 80 hour weeks every week. I'm going to be on call a lot. I'm going to be in the hospital late night, early morning, seeing a lot of patients. That's inevitable. But am I going to enjoy coming into work every day to see these people and work with them and feel like I could, you know, form really strong bonds with them? So I'm hopeful that I have some externships still scheduled. I don't know if they will get canceled. Um, If they do, there's again nothing I can do about it and I will just continue to look for other opportunities but I'm still gonna apply match has been you know delayed by about a month which is just helpful for gathering all of the materials like your recommendations and your CV and your um, letter of intent But ultimately, I'm still going to apply, and by March 1st, I will, in theory, know where I've matched, and I will graduate in May, and I will start my internship sometime in June of 2021. Where that could potentially go awry, as I was saying before, is, well, what happens if graduation gets delayed? And there's a few possibilities, and I don't know that anybody is planning for it at the moment which is very hard for someone like me who likes to plan things very, very, very well in advance. But what is that? What happens to my internship? If I don't graduate until, I don't know, let's just say August, just pick a random date. So I have an August graduation. Do I not have any available internships? But you assume that if Illinois is graduating late, then probably all of the all of the colleges are graduating late because we're not an isolated state. And so the internships are going to need interns. That's why they have interns and they want to teach and they want to have people be exposed to different specialties and they want, you know, they open up those positions because they, they want people. So do they say, okay, you can just start as soon as you graduate. But for someone like me who wants to specialize and I'm applying for residencies sometime in the late fall, it's like this whole vicious cycle all over again where I'm basically starting my internship and having to say, well, I'm applying in a couple months. So could you please evaluate me and tell me if you would be willing to write me a strong recommendation. And then how does that impact the following year's residency class? You know, do I only do, what would that be, nine months of an internship instead of a true 12 year or 12 months, I'm sorry, um, internship, 12 years of an internship would be, I don't know if anybody in their same (laughs) mind would do that. Um, 12 months of an internship or do I just do nine months 
or do the residencies get pushed back? And now I'm kind of on this September to September time frame, you know, and again, I don't think anybody's really planning for this. I'm sure there are some people, you know, I'm, I'm not the only one in this position and I'm sure there are some people who are thinking about it. I don't think any solutions are going to be made until it is actively happening. But as a type A hyper planner, I can't help but have it cross my mind and how that impacts me personally. And what does that mean for my relationship? And what does that mean for my family? You know, what does that mean for the goals that I have for myself that aren't necessarily related to veterinary medicine? And all of this just kind of, you know, I could go on and it could be this terrible rabbit hole that I have sometimes have to pull myself out of because you know, you can get lost in what if, and what if this happens? And then what if I don't match here? And then what if I match somewhere else? And I'm there for three years, and then I have to come back and find a job. And it's, where do I get a job? And what if nobody's hiring because of this pandemic and the possible systemic effects it has years later on all of these small businesses, veterinary medicine and not. And so again, it's like a rabbit hole, and it's a terrible place to be in. Um, mentally, so I try not to do that very often, but it it's a definitely crossed my mind. It is very hard to live in uncertainty, and I when I think about things like that, it's so easy to go into the what ifs, and I tend to try. There's um, there's a line I've heard, which is all you can do is make the best decision you can with the information you have at hand, and and that's. I mean, that sounds good, but it's also so hard when so many things, yeah. you know, rely on all these different aspects. And it's, it's this game in our head of how do we find solace in what we can respond to and we can do right here, right now. And, and at the same time, almost get okay with the uncertainty of not knowing and becoming and, and focusing our efforts on the things that we do know for sure, right? The real tangibles that are in our life. And that's, and that's really challenging. And I can imagine really, really hard as a veterinary student, especially a fourth year. And I, I almost think that it's harder for the class of 2021 than it was for the class of 2020, because it almost feels like the class of 2020 just made it out before this all just, you yeah. know, got so crazy. Yeah, they, they did. And I'm not going to say that they didn't lose things Absolutely. too. Like not having the graduation ceremony is terrible, but it's a real possibility for us too. You know, like no one's just going to say next spring, everything's going to be fine. And that, you know, all of our parents and our grandparents and our family and our friends are going to be able to gather in a small, in a stadium and watch us walk across the stage. Like, I don't, I don't know if that's, if I'm going to get a graduation and if I do get a ceremony, are my parents going to be allowed to be in attendance or are they going to be watching on zoom while it's just me and my class there? And, and that's a whole nother thing that I have been thinking about, but yeah, they did. They kind of escaped. They escaped by like the skin of their teeth. They were like, Oh, let me just get out right now. I'm going to practice. <laughs> and, and at the same time, the stories that you hear from those, you know, the class of 2020, there was definitely, as we said, there was a lot of challenges there as well, right? And they're just different oh, challenges, God. right? And so what what kind of advice, you know, along the lines of classes having different challenges, the class of 2024, who are now just entering veterinary school, what advice would you give to yourself if you were starting veterinary school this fall? I think the theme of 2020 that I've decided on is adaptability. And this pandemic has forced me to be adaptable and to take things at face value. And I think my advice, especially for the first year class, would just be to enjoy the ride. Veterinary school has, it's up it's down, it's in between. Sometimes you don't even know what day it is. But at the end of the day, you're in the most amazing profession filled with some of the smartest people on this planet, people who are going to make positive change, people who are going to represent you and represent, uh, you know, on a 
I should say on like a policy standpoint, there are going to be people and mentors your whole life who are going to ask you about what this is going to be like for you. And I think you just need to remember why you chose to go to veterinary school in the first place. And sticking to your why is probably what's gotten me through. And it's because I love this profession and the people that I've met in it. And the class of 2024, much like the class of 2021 and all of the classes in between, have something in common now that a lot of veterinarians, while they're going through this pandemic, didn't have. And they're going to see changes and they're going to have new experiences that I didn't even have, right? Like, like I was saying earlier, Illinois is very, very lucky to have, or Illinois students are very lucky to have eight weeks of clinical experience in their first and their second year. And I'm pretty confident that those experiences are going to go online now, um, which is not what they signed up for probably last year when they were filling out the VIMCAST and applying to veterinary schools. And they said, I want to go to Illinois because I'm going to be in the clinic in the veterinary teaching hospital in October of my first year. And that's a really hard thing to lose. And that's a really difficult loss to explain because it's, again, it's not the university's fault. It's not like the university is saying, well, we just don't want first years in the, in the hospital anymore. So we're just going to make them online. And they have to support each other. They have to band together. And they have to take each and every day that they are still learning and that their teachers are still putting together lectures and materials for them. And at the end of the day, they're going to graduate and be the most prepared, more prepared than I am, the most prepared veterinarians at that time. And that's kind of the best part about veterinary medicine is that each class that graduates is better than the class that came before it. And I don't think that's just because they're online this year and possibly online in future years that that's going to be any different. I really like what you said about sticking to your why and your, and your purpose. And that if you focus on that, that's where, that's what can drive you. Yeah. I think that it took me a long time to really find my core why, because I had always, again, like I talked about earlier in the episode, I, I was in, I was a kid that just said I was always going to be a veterinarian on like my eighth grade projects when people were like, what do you want to be when you grow up? I, was, I wrote veterinarian. I, my mom still has them in our attic. Um, and it took me until I got here and I met the people around me and I have the most supportive and best group of friends who are also going to be my colleagues here than I've ever had in my entire life. And it's, it's a very humbling experience, to say the least. It's, it's amazing to feel so supported by a group of people, just so unconditionally. Like, I never have to think about if I, you know, asked my friend, if I was having a rough day on clinics, and I was just like, hey, could you please run to McDonald's and grab me a burger because I haven't eaten all day and I'm not going to have a chance to. I, any one of my friends, I don't doubt would be like, yeah, absolutely. I'll be there in 10 minutes, you know? And that is such a humbling experience that I've never had before that school. And that I think will, I will carry throughout my career and approach that to every opportunity that I'm presented with. So whether that's internship, residency, my first time, my first full-time job, you know, whatever it is, I just want to be that person that someone else can always count on. And that's what I've found here. And I consider myself very lucky for it. That's a very, very special 
thing to have in a veterinary class and with colleagues and with other humans. And it's wonderful that you found that there in your veterinary school experience. And really, you know, in that you found these lifelong friends and and colleagues. And I, I love how you put it that they'll be your mentors and your friends and that you'll continue to explore together and expand and grow and learn and uh, what a what a wonderful gift to get out of veterinary school. Yeah, and there's and there's definitely been a lot of hardships. I mean, there's been a lot of hard times and hard exams, and there's been a ton of really low points. And meeting them and having them as my colleagues, it, it makes it. I don't know, it makes it all worth it at the end of the day. That's wonderful to hear, Victoria. I really appreciate, you know, you sharing so much of your story with us and, and giving us some insight into what it's like being a fourth year. And um, I like to sort of end the episodes by asking kind of a fun question, which is, <laughs> sure. do you have a secret talent or something you enjoy doing, which, you know, many might not know what that is or something that's, that is a favorite thing of yours to do and spend your time? Um, well, I, so I definitely don't have a secret talent, um, but I was a competitive gymnast growing up and fitness is a big part of my life. I don't think that that's a secret um, necessarily. I'm a pretty open book in terms of a human being. I don't really hold back on a lot of things about my life. I kind of wear my heart on my sleeve and I kind of give my all to everybody. So it's not a secret, but I haven't tried in a long time. And by a long time, I mean like two or three years, but I'm pretty sure if I tried, I could probably still do a backflip, which I'm pretty proud of at 25 years old. I mean, obviously now you're going to have to try and report back. I know. Now I've, <laughs> now I've set myself up for failure here. Now what we're going to need is a video of you doing the backflip as a way to promote this episode. I mean, obviously. Oh, yeah. oh great. <laughs> I'm going to be like crashing and burning and eat grass. And I'm going to be like, I did it. Watch this Vin Foundation episode. <laughs> there you go. Perfect promotion. My veterinary pole. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's I guess that's like that's pretty much the most interesting thing about me <laughs> well I look forward to seeing this video now and thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us I really appreciate it I know that you're extremely busy and I'm really rooting for you and I hope that this year that you get the 36 hours or you know that you get at least the 30 hours that you need and that you know things Are you start about weeks Yep. Sorry. 36 weeks. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was like, I, yeah. that's, that's what I call COVID brain. So I really hope that you get the 30 weeks that you need and I'm rooting for you for things to go well. And I really appreciate you taking the time to share your story with us. Well, thank you so much for allowing me to kind of vent about all of this, to be honest. It was like a nice little therapeutic vent session about COVID. We try not to talk about it amongst our friends because it's just, so evident in our faces. So it is very nice to be able to talk about it in hopefully what was a helpful and educational way and not necessarily in a sad and frustrating way. Um, but yeah, I just hope that anybody who listens to this can kind of take away that it is going to be okay. And no matter where you are in your veterinary career, whether that's you're a pre-vet scared about applying to you know, a veterinarian out in practice in 10 years, that our community is amazing. And that no matter who you are, or where you practice or what you practice, we're all here to support each other. Um, and if I can be a support system to anybody, I would be more than happy to do that. Because I think that sharing our stories and talking about our grief and talking about the things we've lost makes it real. And that if you can come out the other side, a stronger human, then somebody else thinks that they can do it too. And that's, I think, the biggest thing. I completely agree with you. And I 100% um, agree with what you said. And 
thank you for offering that support to your colleagues and doing what you're doing and helping care for our animals. I, for one, am very grateful. So thanks so much, Victoria. Well, thank you, Jordan. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Veterinary Pulse. Please check the episode notes for additional information referenced in the podcast. If you enjoyed this podcast, please follow, subscribe, and share review. We welcome feedback and hope you will tune in again. You can find out more about the VIN Foundation through our website, vinfoundation.org, and our social media channels. Thank you for being here. Be well.